Roll. Here. 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 Thank you. Um, yeah, I have to be in Salem for a hearing this afternoon, so I do have to leave it 10 till. Um, let's take approval of the minutes. Are there any uh, corrections or additions to the minutes as proposed? If not, is there a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Roll call on those, please. Aye. 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 Okay, uh, let's move on into any introductory comments from you, Sam, before we take public comment. So. Nope. Okay. Anyone want to speak uh, on non-agenda items and public comment? We have three. I'm going to try to stay short without speaking. Okay. okay. Let me ask you to each be brief and to the point and give you a couple minutes each. Come on up, please. All at once? You sure? Why not? There's three of you, three, three seats. Make yourselves comfortable. But again, not too comfortable because we have to get out of here in about 30 minutes. <laughs> I have a prepared statement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good, I got it. Okay, Mr. Stevens, why don't you go first? <clears throat> well, the first issue was, it's a continuing issue. In fact, all three of these are. Uh, I brought up the fact that, uh, that I saw in the newspaper where PERS had decided to forgive the... Uh, the overpayment issue that had occurred with their members, the retired members. And I said, why was PERS allowed to do so when apparently IRS said that we had to get it back and our members were actually threatened <coughs> with a lot of dire consequences if they didn't produce the, the overpayment. And, and at that time, you said you'd have the pension board pursue it. I received a call at home from Mr. Gabe Sansone, who is the uh, liaison for the fire department, and he asked the particulars of it, and I found the article, I read it to him, and he was going to contact PERS, and he was going to find out what the circumstances were of how they were allowed to forgive the payment. Okay. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but, but uh, the staff for the fund have produced a memorandum that responds to some of your questions? No, I have not seen So that. we'll make sure you get a copy of that. Might want to get you to review that memorandum and then come back and comment further rather than go through those issues now because we did get a written response to a lot of your questions. Just okay, I'd be happy to look at that. That'd be great. Yeah, why don't you take I, I a wish, look at I wish that they could have mailed that to me because just, I'm the one that raised the issue. It came out today. So, uh, it came out today? Yep, so provided to the board today. So. Okay. So if you have, if you could take a take a look at that and then come to our next meeting, let us know if you think it was okay. Covered. Well, uh, but but in the same context of the of the first issue, we had the issue of the members that, that made their overpayment. Right. Okay. Right. And and you said that everybody in the board and the board felt that it was wrong the way it was handled, and they they should have been part of the settlement. In fact, you asked me if I wanted to be part of it, and I said I did. If everybody else could be also. And you said, my, my hands are tied. We've explored all the options. We have no way to do it. And I told you about two months ago that I was there to untie your hands. And I said, there's a way to do it. And I said, the Bureau of Risk Management has the ability to correct errors in judgment or omission or administrative practices, however it occurs, that they can, they can deal with equity and make things right. That's their purpose. And I asked if you would either go to them personally or call them on the phone and ask them to include those members that were left out of the settlement, so they also shared in that 40% return, and you said you would do so. We are, we are going to get those questions answered, Dell. So, so yeah, you say what? We're going to get those questions answered. So, okay. What, so, what, they, so it's not a dead do. issue. It's still alive, right? Unfinished business. Okay. Well, I think it's important because there's a lot of people expecting some kind of results. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing was, uh, I'll just be real, real brief. You know, going to the bi-monthly meetings works a hardship on a lot of people because they've got issues that are continuing issues that they want to pursue. And uh, about a year ago, the, the board decided they would go to a bi-monthly schedule and they would skip all the, the, the summer meetings. And I think that is a violation of due process. We, and, we also, and that's for, also covered in the memo that you have. Is it? Yes. Okay, well, for about, for about 75 years, we had monthly meetings and we, every two weeks we had an expediting meeting. And people that have medical issues and, and real concerns that have to be dealt with, 
they don't want to wait four months to, to bring the issue up again. It's, but Dell, things have changed here too. We're not hearing um, claims. Well, you may not hear the claim so, because, but 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 you could hear the the issue that the, the member has. There's one of them here today that has an issue, and he had had no way to present it for two months. I understand it, but I think that's why there were many more meetings in the past. The right. the, the meetings were a lot of time right. spent on those because there was thoughtful deliberation. Those issues don't come in from the board anymore because of the charter change. So I think I understand your concern about having fewer meetings, but I think that we have an appropriate number of meetings to cover what we need to cover. Okay. okay. The last thing I would say is. You know, in, in the current climate in government, people want to see things transparent. They want to know what's going on. They want to be informed. To Walton Valley Fire and Rescue, uh, they uh, uh, have a, a monthly meeting. They announce it in the Oregonian. The agenda is published, and it's uh, generally two weeks prior to the meeting so that the public that's interested and the members, they're aware of it. Uh, we're going the other direction. We're, we're going to bi-monthly meetings and no meetings in the summer. And the only way you can find out the agenda is you have to wait two weeks prior to the meeting and you look on the internet. A lot of people don't, don't even have computers. It's, it, it's, it's the wrong way to, for us to go. And I would like to see our board publish the agenda and announce the meeting in the paper as a public announcement, just like these other organizations are doing. I can, I can make a whole list of organizations that publish their meeting notices and their agenda. Why can't we do that? It's a cost-saving measure, I'm assuming. Yeah. Oh, come on. I, I, if you're talking about a budget of, of $50 million uh, to, to put an ad in the newspaper, that's ridiculous. All right. Thank you, Dell. Thank you. Okay. Take Those are the three issues, and I, I will read this. Okay. Do, please. Uh, my name is Joe Jimkowski, for the record, and I have a, a letter here I brought. Okay. Uh, I brought it to the board because I can't get resolution anywhere else, and this is like the last step I have in the city. Yes, Joe. Before it goes to other levels. Thanks. And, and try and get resolved. I have a, uh, it came with an email and a signed copy I have at home, but it was a certified mail. Okay. It says in the letter that um, what I asked for was I was medically separated in 2005 and the city was doing that. So after five years of medical separation, the uh, city rules say that you're no longer a city employee. I was fine with that. You know, I, I left with a permanent injury, a progressive, a progressive permanent injury. So I know, so I was fine with that. Well, after five years, I went ahead, and I knew I had about 2,000 hours sick leave there. I went and inquired about that, since I'm no longer a city employee, I thought. Mm -hmm. Everyone told me, no, 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 you're still a city employee, you're still a city employee. Finally, after pushing enough, uh, I got a resolution from the Fire Bureau via Jim uh, Fairchild saying, some emails came up too, saying that uh, I, was, uh, I, I was retired on disability retirement via the medical separation process. And since, I, since that was that way, it wasn't a regular pension retirement. It's not a violation of the contract. And the only way to get a, your sick leave payoff and, and VIVA is to the contract. Even with that, I'm okay with that. I can walk away from that. I didn't get the 2,000 hours. The city keeps it. Fine. I can walk away from that. I thought it was all done at that point. During that five-year process, though, when I was laid off, I mean, when you met separate, met separated, I was taking the court. I, took the, I, I, I filed a motion because I, I uh, they froze my disability. They said that when a person is medically separated, you're no longer a cop or a firefighter. So therefore, the first day you, you're separated on injury leave, your salary is frozen for life. That's it. You never get a raise again. I objected to that. So, yeah, I took them to court. I challenged it. It ended up in the courts. It went to the administrative law court. It went to the circuit court. Ended up at the Court of Appeals. In the end, uh, in the end, I had a favorable decision where for three years I didn't get any kind of raise in compensation. I don't know if anybody else, I think it was just me getting that. And then after three years, uh, I, got, I got back raises from the, as per the contract, as per, as per position I held last. That's what they're trying to say. They're trying to say that once I left, I'm no longer tied to that position. I'm no longer tied to anything else. I'm not a cop or a firefighter anymore. So an injured cop or firefighter in Portland is no longer a cop or firefighter. That's changed. It, now you are. You will be because of three years fighting it. So that, that, that stands now. And it's also tied to your last position, which stands now. After the five years, though, when I pushed for this letter, they said I was medically separated. And they said, you're gone. You're no longer an, it says I'm a civilian. You're no longer an employee of the city. I was fine with that. I walked away. I'm fine. I have my disability check coming each month. I, you know, I got to see my doctor each month, take my meds. Everything was fine. I get another letter just recently. said, well, guess what? We're going to retire you. And I said, wait a minute. I'm, I'm a civilian already. They said, well, no, no, you're not. I said, well, wait a minute. A letter says I'm a civilian right here. I'm no longer an employee. I'm not a firefighter. They said, well, you're still a member of FPDR. And I said, well, but that's for cops and firefighters. I was medically separated. The city says I'm gone. They took my sick leave. So, my sick leave, that's fine. They wanted that, keep it. 
I'll walk away. I said, leave me, just leave me alone. But they said, well, no, 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 we're going to retire you as if you work for 30 years, because wait, 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 another rule over here, it says this. I said, wait, you can't use this rule on me, and then all of a sudden say, forget that rule over there, take everything away from me, and then come over here, now we're going to use this rule on you. I, I just said, I, I just want to be left alone, I said. I just want to be left alone to heal, okay? That's all I want to worry about right now. And so I brought this forward to you because I went to the pension folks there. They told me, well, no, no, that, that, that's, not, that's not right. That's not right. You're misunderstanding. I said, well, I don't think I am, I said. And now I, have a, I didn't have the letter then. Now I have a letter, a certified letter from the city telling me I'm gone. I'm a civilian. Okay, now I know I'm gone. You know, I know it's tied to the last position I held. So I know my raises, we cut, my, my, my um, disability is tied to that position. And that's all I asked for. And that's all any cop or firefighter would ask for who gets hurt. You would want it if you got shot today, or you got, you got you know, hurt today to fire. You, you, you guys both would want that. That's all I asked for. So you got this letter last August. Have you had any further discussions with the Oh, yeah, staff yeah. I got letters since then from FPDR telling me I got a letter in January. First, I got, I got a letter in January, two letters in January telling me they retired me in February. Then they said, oh, made a mistake. You laid off for 81 days. Because they said, you know, they asked me about it. I said, well, I don't recognize that day. I said, I'm gone. I'm a civilian. And they said, well, we're going to retire you in May now, as if you worked here for 30 years. And I said, well, but I don't work here anymore. I said, I'm a civilian. How do you retire a civilian? And they told me on the phone, well, you know, it, it's, it's all spelled out. We'll send it to you. Twice I called, twice they never sent it to me. So I know, I know it's not there because you can't retire a civilian. Yeah. Okay. You know? All right. Well, I appreciate you letting us in on this. Well, I came uh, to you because there's no other recourse. I mean, the next recourse is, is take legal action, and I want to avoid that if I can for all sides. All right. Well, thank you. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to discuss it with the thank staff. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, I prepared these remarks some time ago, but due to a lack of pension board meetings, I offer them today, believing that they're still relevant, and I wish to speak to you for myself only concerning what recent decisions and actions related to our system. And I do mean our, I mean that's the retirees, both of the fire bureau and the police bureau, and the working members of both organizations. And from my conversations with many other retirees, our appreciation for Local 43's bearing the burdens of these actions is greatly appreciated. It's unfortunate that retirees, considering the size of the group, are not represented on the board. The somewhat reference addresses decisions made by uh, some present members of the board and previous members of the board in the past several years. And I believe that presently there are at least five grievances of Local 43 has filed related to retirees, which are working their way through the system with two other recently ruled on by the state court in favor of the local that directly affected pensioners. And the latest two rejections by the state Supreme Court include the rejection of the board's denial of firefighter Tom Hurley's occupational injury claim and the decision not to restore pension monies after the death of a divorced spouse by changing an administrative ruble. It's my belief that the Hurley decision was made without the boards looking into the ancient, ancient struggle between the Fire Bureau and the FPDR and was politically motivated to ameliorate the reporting in the local newspaper. The push and pull of limited duty or part-time duty for the longest time was over who was going to pay. And prior heads of the FPDR said that if members were working on limited duty or part-time under doctor's orders, then the fire bureau would bear the entire cost, as if the member was whole. As all the fire bureau personnel are required to report for full duty in case of a citywide emergency, there good, could be no limited duty or part-time duties then. Ergo, negotiations with the union would be required to create these positions. I personally experienced this uh, situation when assigned to the training division. We had more work than the staff was able to cover, and I have attempted to find limited duty members or part-time members to help out. And I had several members who wanted to work, but I couldn't get through the bureaucratic issues. And the Fire Bureau and the Commissioner's position was that there were no positions in the budget for limited or part-time duty members, and the city would not allow for them to be added. It was a classic stalemate, and when the agreement for limited duty positions was worked out, then the FPDR board had to negotiate with Local 43. They chose to ignore that reality and adopted the attitude that it was the city's responsibility and made up their own quote-unquote administrative rule that was eventually rejected 
through the grievance pr protocol in the court system. Isn't it ironic that in the recent past five years or so that the board and the city have gone over six on previous or present board decisions based on a or the city attorney's opinion? Now we both, the board and the retirees, are waiting for the next big decision on the COLA from the Oregon State Supreme Court. As an aside, once upon a time, an assistant attorney, city attorney, was assigned to the pension board as part of the overall duties of the city attorney. Related to that, I'd like to bring up what legal costs are to the FPDR for paying for the city attorney's present now at board meetings and the pursuit of the board's decisions based on the city attorney's advice. This is not in the document, but it's kind of is the hen uh, is the fox guarding the hen house door. This versus the local cost of local 43. These conflicts are affecting the budget of the FPDR, which in the long term impacts the retirees. Wouldn't it be beneficial to look deeper into the pool and listen to the arguments against more closely than taking these actions. For instance, changing the administrative rule on rest restoration of benefits, and then when a divorced ex-spouse dies, and eventually having to restore them. I'm sure the staff thought it was great advice, and the city attorney said it was, but I'm also sure that the retirees and local 43s and the police union's attorneys objected. <coughs> Another comment related to the Hurley decision is, I have yet to hear or read that any of the members of the board or boards or the administrator of the FPDR or have I seen in the Oregonian in all of Maxine Bernstein's reporting that members on injury and the line of duty status had to have approval of the board to seek other employment outside the FPDR. Consequently, the citizens of Portland who are paying for the pension system think that all members off work due to injury are wastrels, fakes, flakes, and who are using the system rather than having a real injury due to their working conditions and situations. Every day, firefighters and police officers are called to emergencies to do what untrained and uncertified civilians shouldn't do. I wish I had all the answers to these problems so that I could have more confidence that the board believes in the opening words of Chapter 5 of the Charter of the City of Portland. These words are the Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Fund originally created and established for the benefit of the sworn employees of the Bureau of Fire, Rescue and Emergency Services, herein the Bureau of Fire and the Bureau of Police of the City of Portland, herein after the Bureau of Police, and for the benefit of the surviving spouses and dependent minor, child, minor children of deceased sworn members. Presently, I hold, opinion, I hold the opinion, as do many others, that there now exists an adversarial relationship between the members of the system and the system. Perhaps someday in the future, a more collaborative arrangement will come about, much like the concept of collaborative bargaining present in other parts of the country. Thank you for your uh, opportunity for me to speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. All right, let's move into the regular agenda um, and take up the first item. Thank you. Okay, you want to read um, item number one? You want to put that in the, we have to call that up, resolution number 499, right? Do you want to read that first item so we can take it up? Resolution 499. I just, okay, Sam? Okay, well, I'll have Nancy go ahead and explain what the uh, contract is that we're looking to have approved. Okay. So this resolution authorizes contracting with a consulting group at Moss Adams to perform the pension program audit that the board directed staff um, to have done. The not to exceed price is a little under $76,000. Uh, we've scheduled to kick off meeting for tomorrow. We expect to have most of the work completed by June 30th and a board presentation to you in July. Any questions? Okay, pretty swift. 
<laughs> I can talk longer. <laughs> no, no. Questions? Okay. Anyone have any comments on this item before we adopt it? So we just have to approve the resolution and that authorizes yeah. you to proceed? Yes. Anyone want to speak? Okay, then a roll call on resolution number 499, please. Aye. Mr. Coach? Aye. Aye. Okay, and our second item is a disability audit report. Our Milliman staff here. Yes. And the Mayor Hill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very pleased to present this report to you. Milliman was hired as a claims um, contractor, essentially, to review the claims operations of FPDR. Um, what that means is we go in and we look at the purpose of the operation and then we look at the entire uh, facets of the operation to ensure that they're um, effectuating the main purposes of, of the operation itself. So we'll look at staffing, we'll look at workloads, we'll look at management, we'll look at vendor resourcing, et cetera, et cetera. Report back to, to, to you and others on how the operation is performing relative to industry standards. Um, there were five specific areas that were encompassed in the operation. These are not the only areas by any stretch of the imagination, but they were pointed out to Milliman prior to the review as making sure we include them. Compare this program to other programs. Are there any improvements that can be made? Are there any potential cost savings that we're not realizing that we should? Um, are there any management reports we should be creating? And um, how are we doing relative to the prior audit, which was conducted, as I understand it, by Marsh a few years ago? Um, the operational review took place last August, September, October, with a final report issued in the end of December and consisted of um, lengthy and extensive interviews of essentially virtually all uh, major claims personnel and people who had influence in the claims operation, as well as looking at claim files themselves that are disability um, and reviewing documentation and, and data. The key findings were, were very favorable. Uh, we were favorably impressed with this operation, particularly compared to other similar operations that perform comparable services around the country that we've seen um, in our decades and, and decades of experience going around and examining these types of operations. Um, in, in every category, the management of the disability claims of the FPDR was either meeting or exceeding, in many cases, industry standard practices that we have seen um, over the years for these types of operations, and indeed are out you know, in, in front of the eight ball, if you will, in, in some key areas. 93% um, of the files that, that we reviewed uh, met or exceeded industry standards in one or more categories. None of them failed industry standards in all categories at all. So and those the, are the, categories like timeliness, accuracy. That's um, correct, right. Mayor Hales. We, we specifically looked at 10 subcategories of file technical claims handling, including those areas and others, medical management, yeah. vendor resources, management controls, et cetera, mm -hmm. timely contact. We were privy to the audit findings from prior audits, the immediately prior audit, so we understood that there were some staff turnover, some changes that had been implemented, and we wanted to make sure that those um, had been addressed. And um, I'm very happy to report that they have been addressed um, above and beyond in our professional opinion from what we've seen. Uh, nonetheless, there are some opportunities for improvement. None of the four things listed here are major problems by any stretch. I don't want anyone to get that impression. Um, it's a small operation. They operate very well together. Uh, nonetheless, we felt that there were some inconsistencies noted in a few of the files. There were some inconsistencies noted in some of the interview responses to common questions. And we thought it might behoove the operation to have a little bit more structure around things like a training program or a claims manual to help aid in making sure that consistent results are, are being effectuated throughout the operation. We were asked specifically to help uh, management develop key reports um, to make sure that we're running the operation well from, from a management point of view in terms of looking at key data, metrics, without over-reporting, if you will. I, I don't want management having 20 reports in their box a day that they're not going to look at and don't have time to do anything with. However, there are a few key ones that I think would aid them, and we've been helping them uh, think about that and develop those management reports so that they can get a good bird's eye uh, view of what's going on in the operation and identify patterns, trends, and problems effectively and quickly. Um, there may be a little bit of cost savings achieved. I think they're doing very, very well in that area. But there may be a little bit of cost savings achieved in the compliance issue for the SGA, the substantial gainful activity. We noted in the files and in the interview responses, again, a little bit of inconsistency there when there's noncompliance on the part of the member. What do you do, for example? So we might be able to clean up that area a little bit, 
none of these opportunities for improvement I would consider major problems at all. Um, but we've been working uh, with management to help them understand those areas a little bit better. Happy to report that since the 2008 and then the subsequent audit by Marsh, um, those uh, areas that Marsh had identified as being problems are not problems. In fact, uh, when we did our operational review last fall and went back and read some of those audit reports, I was so surprised because those areas of weaknesses we found to be actually areas of strength in many cases, above and beyond what we, what we would normally see in the industry. Um, we were asked to look at this and compare it to other programs. It is unique. This is an interesting program because you're doing disability benefits that are both for service and non-service, and that's virtually unheard of. I, 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 it's very rare. It's very unusual. Normally, the disability um, service is separated from the disability non-service, and the disability service is almost always captured under a workers' comp state statute. Um, and subject to those rules and regulations, which you're probably very much aware, vary uh, sometimes greatly from state to state. So it's a, it, it's a different operation here. Uh, nonetheless, with respect to the service disability, it's a very similar program to what we see in workers' compensation and, and generally out there in the industry and in other states. Um, you have uh, you know, wage loss replacement, both on a temporary basis as well as on a permanent basis, just like we have in other service-related disability claims. We have ongoing medical, et cetera. Um, depending on the state, we would have COLA uh, increases as, as well. Uh, the amount of payment may differ here than in, in other jurisdictions in service-related disability, but the structure is basically the same. It's very sound and reasonable. It seems to be working well relative to what we're seeing in, in, other, uh, in other industry. Um, as far as the detailed findings from the, from the claims practices, we did find that the staff is working very well. They have appropriate levels of staff with the appropriate expertise handling the, the right claims, if you will. They're more experienced people handling the experienced claims. Um, there are some opportunities for more junior people to, to advance and get um, sort of one-on-one -on -one training to work their way up to the more complex claims. The workflow, which is basically the life of a claim as it comes in the door and then is ultimately resolved, is working quite well. I think their vendor management is very good indeed. They uh, don't seem to be inefficient in terms of hiring outside resources um, and wasting a lot of money and time on outside resources. And in fact, one very key resource has been brought in-house medical bill review, and uh, which uh, I think I believe is going to ultimately result in savings for them and more efficient and better outcomes for the members as well. So I was pleased to see that sort of control in other areas of, of service-related disability, what I'll refer to as workers' comp, we often see those types of costs run way out of control and result in a lot of litigation and inefficiencies, and I'm not seeing that here. So I was, I was very pleased to see that they have that tightly controlled. The supervision is very good uh, within the operation itself. Um, it was very notable in the files and very evident among the staff when I was talking to them. I don't feel like anybody is going rogue, and, and I don't feel there's any danger of that happening at all. System controls are in place for payments, et cetera. Um, it, it, I sat down and looked at the computer system and made sure that those system controls are in place so we don't have to worry about those types of accidents happening. Uh, we were favorably impressed with the return to work program. We looked at several files where, again, if I were in any other industry in another state, uh, looking at a workers' compensation program, I would just assume that this is going to be a person who would never get back to work, and they're returning to work, and that's excellent. It's, I'm not talking about excellent because it's financially excellent. It's excellent because that psychological empowerment and that social integration is key to medical improvement, mm -hmm. and that's undisputed amongst professionals when you look at these claims over and over, and the fact that they can return people to productive lifestyles is very is very key to, to a sound program and, and a healthy membership, too. So I was very impressed with the return to work efforts in the return to work program um, in the files that I reviewed in the interviews I conducted. I appreciate you emphasizing that, you know, back to that charter requirement that this is for the benefit of the retirees. It's not just financial. So I appreciate you highlighting that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to say that the police bureau is limited to 10 positions. So many police bureau members sit at home burning sick time as opposed to being at work in these transition yeah. programs. Yeah. So we need to increase those positions. That's a good point. We've talked with the chiefs about that since you now have a new chief. We'll bring that issue back yeah. up again. I, I certainly hope that they would look at the benefits yeah. of this program. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think this gives us more weight to take it back to the chiefs because 
part of those programs are supported by the bureaus, mm -hmm. and we can only push so far with it. But we are more than happy if they could allot 15, 20, 30 positions to it. We'd be all for it. We just have to make sure the bureaus can support that from their side. Good conversation to have. Thank you. The next slide presents more detailed findings on the opportunities for improvement. I don't want to linger too long on this slide. We have discussed it with management. None of them, as I said before, present anything major in my opinion, but they're, they're just opportunities and things to work toward and, and think about and consider. I don't want to fix anything that isn't broken, and I hesitate to go in like a bull in a china shop and make a lot of changes that I don't think are necessary. Um, but, but these uh, types of changes might, might behoove the operation itself. And then finally, we were asked to, again, just ensure that there has been progress made since the prior audit. And there, there certainly has been. Marsh conducted two audits. And Marsh itself saw improvement between its first and its second audit, which I don't think is too surprising. We found considerable improvement since the second Marsh audit and, and our audit. Um, uh, my understanding is back at, in, in that time, there may have been quite a bit of staff turnover and some changes and some new things being embraced and tested. And it seems that at the point that Milliman went in there last summer and fall that we've reached a steady state and things have really stabled out. And we can see that um, in, in the results of the file review and the operational review that we conducted. So uh, they, they are compliant and indeed, uh, if not within standard industry practices, exceeding standard industry practices in almost every area that we could test. Thank you very much for letting me present this. If you, you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. No, great report. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the incisiveness and thoroughness of the report, and I think it really reflects well on, on present and previous uh, leadership uh, here at, at the Bureau. So thank you. Great work. Questions? One question on the, right at the beginning on page six, program overview, and it's talking about reform changes. And the first one you noted was FPDR. FPDNR was established as a separate entity in 2007. You know, we've had a lot of discussions about what FPDNR, where they fall. Where, why did you, where did you get that? The of charter? the page six of the report. Yeah. I can answer that for her just a minute. Date of the charter change. That's the date of the charter change. And then when we were created as a bureau, prior to that, FPDNR was a subset of the audit, auditor's office. So this is where we became an independent bureau and not involved with another. Okay, and we've had that question about it being part of the city and not part of the city. I just don't, for the record, it's it's a bureau. I'm not. Of the city of Portland. It's a bureau of the city of Portland. Bureau is the city of Portland. Thank bureau. You. That's what we mean by independent. We are our own. Fund bureau. is independent, but the bureau is the city of Portland bureau. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. Any okay. other questions? Thank you so much. Great work. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> okay. So we're at 148, and Mayor, you need to leave here in a, leave in a minutes. couple minutes. If there are any other information items that you need to cover quickly, but not right now. So what we're going to do here is there's a this was part of a uh, action item where we wanted you to accept the report, but we still have a couple more things to do before you get to that point. One is that Kim and I will present our response to it and our action plan okay. to the report, and then you'll have some public comment that you'd all like to hear before you accept it. So that will be a topic on our next board agenda. We'll pick up this topic right where we left off. In the meantime, we'll get you a copy of the, the presentation that you saw. And, uh, you know, again, uh, we'll give uh, David and Justin an opportunity if they have some questions prior to the next board Good. meeting. About so we'll continue this answer. item to our April meeting, take take your response, take public testimony, and then take and then action on accepting Take action on it at that point, okay. yes. And that's our April meeting? Well, April meeting, we may have also the other settlement that we were talking about right. to approve that, and then we'll just sort of pick up right where we stopped here and continue through. There may be a couple more items <coughs> on that meeting. Also, with the April meeting, you had all talked about at this meeting, we want to talk of the annual adjustment or COLA. Do you want to move that into April? Because we, we pushed it off because not all the board was here. Because you both talked about you wanted to have two meetings on that, and typically is May when you resolve that. Is there any word on the, uh, the case? The Supreme Court decision, no. We're just sort of keeping our fingers crossed, hoping that they do push it out soon, but there's no indication they will or will not. Well, then, if that's the case, we might want to wait till May to talk about COLA. Yeah, I just don't want to know if we were going to pain and then have something else. Yeah. So what's the date of our April meeting again? Um, 28th, April 28th. 28th. That okay. will be at normal time, 1 o'clock. Okay. So we'll, uh, so we'll adjourn until April uh, 28th at 1 p.m., and we'll take up this item and anything else you've got on the agenda there. Right. Great. Thank you all. We're adjourned.